We... Ollie, I'm going to talk to Dr Simon Boxall because I know he's in huge demand at the moment. He's an oceanography lecturer. Uh, Dr Boxall, thank you so much for talking to us about this. I mean, what, what, what can you tell us about the environment um, that the submariner is in now and, and you know, what the likelihood is of, of, of these crew members being uh, hauled to safety in the whole some way? In, yeah, I mean, the whole thing is in very deep water. Um, you're looking at nearly four kilometres and that's enormous pressure. But also we can't use standard sort of radio communication. We can't use any of the normal sort of methods we might use on land to detect this sub. The first thing we could do is actually find it, find out where it is. Now, it's not like the sort of the huge search they had for the missing aircraft, they made 370 all those years ago in the Indian Ocean. They know roughly where it is, much more sort of easy to pinpoint. The big issue here is the time scale. You know, they are gonna run out of oxygen by Thursday. Uh, there's no equipment uh, locally, although I've heard that there has been a recent arrival of one of the um, cable laying ships, which does have um, ROV, remotely operated vehicle cameras on board, which could go down to those depths. Um, but once they've located it, they've still got to try and recover it. And if it is down there, you know, normally that would take months. Um, and we've only got a couple of days. I mean, I, I heard somebody who has formally been a voyager on that particular submariner saying that before he got on board, there was an enormous amount of paperwork, mm. enormous numbers of things you had to sign and read. And he said that he heard or saw the word death represented numerous times. And apparently it was actually set in stone in this paperwork that there was at least seven different ways in which you could perish down there. So yeah. yeah, I suppose it's only fair to say that the people on board, they know it's an exceptionally perilous and dangerous thing they're undertaking. I would say it's probably more perilous than going to space, to be honest with you. Really? Um, you know, if things go wrong at those depths, there is no time for, you know, to, 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 to make amends. The pressures are so big. We don't know what's happened to it yet. Time will tell over the next, well, hopefully the next few hours. It could be weeks or months before we know fully, but um, let's just keep our fingers crossed that 1% comes true. I've heard people say 1% a few times. Let's hope it does become that 1% chance of finding and recovering this vessel. But the probability is very much against any any happy outcome from this uh, terrible tragedy. Well, what would you say was the best possible way in which um, a rescue might be affected? How, how would they locate the craft, how how could this happen if it were, if a miracle were to happen, how would it happen? Okay, they'd have to pick it up with the cameras. Um, there's too much rubble down there, too much junk down there from the original Titanic. Um, so they'd need to use cameras, they'd need to almost trip over the um, the uh, submersible. And then they've got to find somewhere getting a tether onto it to bring it to the surface. Um, Again, it depends very much on what equipment is available. You know, we, it's not easy to get the equipment out there quickly. They are 900 miles from the nearest port. And even people have been talking about using Hercules aircraft or whatever to fly stuff out there. That doesn't help if you haven't got the right sort of ships available to deploy that equipment. You still need a ship with, you know, four or five kilometers of cable on board to get cameras and equipment down to those depths. And they're not common. They're very uncommon. Have you ever taken a trip to the bottom of the sea in that kind of way yourself? No, uh, we've used remotely operated vehicles, which is the sensible way to do it. You stay on the surface and you let robots do it. Okay. I have been down a very short distance in what they used to call a Michelin suit. It looks like a Michelin man. It's terrifying. Um, as a professional working in the oceans, as a re researcher, um, you wouldn't get me down in one, I'm afraid. What? What are your thoughts on those sorts of submersibles or that kind of trip, you know, run by an actual company, advertised? Obviously, the people who, who, who go decide to, to, to take the berth at the cost of about £250,000 have yeah. a pretty shrewd idea what they're doing. They're not being inveigled into something against their will. But what are your thoughts on companies offering those sorts of trips? Well, we get companies offering trips to space, so I guess why not the deep ocean? Yeah. People know these things carry risks with them, and I guess it's a sort of, I don't know, is it the adrenaline kick? Is that unique voyage that no one else will ever have done? Um, we will never know, I guess, what inspires people to do this. But, I mean, these days in the UK, you know, research is done primarily using underwater robotics. Mm. It tends to be sort of the Russians, the Americans, the French that tend to use these sorts of vehicles for research purposes. Today, modern day, we can do more with a robot than we can with a man submersible.
Yes, I mean, I did hear one gentleman who had been in the submersible saying that it, although it was the size of a minibus or something quite small, was surprisingly comfortable and he had had a good sleep quite a lot of the way down. Did you hear this gentleman yes, recounting I, his experience? I've heard had a, that. He had a good I, old I sleep, he said, and then he said, and then he sort of, with great luck, they did encounter um, the Titanic or some of it anyway. And he said, you know, so I had a good sleep, you know, then I sort of saw the anchor. I saw a little bit of one of the walls or something. And then we came up again and he thought, God, 250,000 quid for a good sleep <laughs> and, a, and a view of a rusty old anchor. Why would that be? Why would that be a, a desirable trip? I, I didn't really get it, I've got to say. Well, no. And I, I think also, you, you know, you're looking at that trip going down and you talked about it being a bit like a small minibus. Yes, you can sit in a minibus for two or three hours, see something exciting, go home again. Mm. We're talking about being in that minibus for days. You know, uh, there's, there's, to put it bluntly, no toilet facilities. There probably is water. And knowing the fact that your oxygen is running out quite rapidly, it's not going to be a nice environment to be in at the moment. Tom Boxall, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Let's go back to Ollie. So, uh, you know, it's very difficult, isn't it, to, 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 to really put any kind of optimistic topspin on this, I suppose, barring a miracle. Barring a real miracle, because the real outcomes are it's either snagged itself, somehow floats back to the top, but if there has been this catastrophic uh, decompression because of the high pressure, it, it, it'll be the worst case scenario that we could have possibly imagined. And, you know, it's, it's just, it, it's such a needle in a haystack, yes. this operation. But they are trying. Yes. Despite all of the odds. And um, do we know anything much about the passengers on board? We know we know about our own sort of British millionaire. We know that there's a, a very experienced French diver, don't we? And we know that they have been made fully, fully aware of the potential consequences and the danger of the trip. It's not that they stumbled in unknowingly. They, they all knew exactly what they were undertaking. No, definitely. Shazada de Wood and his son are on board. They are British citizens. We've then got the British billionaire Hamish Harding, who's on there. We know from this trip already that it was limited chances that it was even going to go ahead because mm. of how bad the weather was. Yes. In an Instagram post the other day, we heard from Hamish Harding. He specifically said this bit, due to the Worst winter in Newfoundland in 40 years. This mission is likely to be the first and only manned mission of the Titanic in 2023. A weather window has just opened up and we are going to attempt a dive tomorrow. So what was it? Was it the weather? Was it a technical fault? Was it a loss of engine, loss of steam, loss of power? Not lots has been said about the actual composition and mechanics and steering um, methods of this submersible. And I mean, I don't know anything about these kind of matters, but some of it did sound pretty rudimentary, didn't it? A sort of video game console kind of steering wheel or something. Was that what you found out? That's, that's not that unusual. So, you know, Isn't when it? you see um, the unmanned aerial vehicles, which are in the air, the drones that are yes. used by the army. Yes. Sometimes our British forces are using Xbox controllers and PlayStation controllers to control <laughs> those. So that is not necessarily uh, that concerning. But we did hear from a CBS journalist who had been on board the vessel, and he said that he felt there was bits of it that are a little bit sort of stuck together. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And and, and it's, it hasn't been given regulatory approval. But who do you go to for regulatory approval for a vehicle like this? It's not like everybody's going to take a submarine down to those sorts of depths, but ev everybody. We're is actually hoping. showing on screen. If you're listening to this, you won't be able to see it. But if you're watching, you can see there's a there's a um, a, a, a sub ocean view here. I don't know whether we can hear any. It's a simulation of what it must be like in a submariner, twenty thousand leagues or more below the sea. Yeah, yes, really, can... really cold at the moment. Yeah, especially if they've lost any all sorts of power. The temperatures down there are frigid, cold water. Uh, they will have potentially been sat there now for three days oh, we're gosh. coming up to. And the thought of just sitting there praying for the best, mm -hmm. we just, the problem is we just don't know. Just it. in case anybody might be thinking, why don't they sort of open the porthole, get out and swim to, to, to uh, safety, that you cannot open that vehicle, is that correct? You, you can't. And even if the vehicle somehow bod, bob, bobbed up to land and was just bobbing about in the Atlantic, they still can't open it, is that correct? Yeah, it's completely sealed because of the huge amount of pressures that they are currently under. What happens is you've got to make sure that it's compact as possible, that there's no way for the water to get in. So they've got these nuts on the top that they wrench down to make sure that it's as 
watertight as possible. Okay, now we can hear the CEO of the company explaining what it's like on the inside. So we're coming into the sub. This is the only toilet available on a deep diving submersible. Best seat in the house. You can look out the viewport. We put a privacy screen in, turn up the music, and uh, it's uh, very popular. We have our uh, control screen here, our sonar screen here, and we can put any image we want in the back. It's all run with this game controller and these touch screens. So if you want to go forward, you press forward. If you want to go back, you go back, turn left, turn right, go down, go up. And it's Bluetooth, so I can hand it to anybody. Gosh, I mean, it does look something on the prim primitive side, doesn't it, really? Well, it's never going to look like a Mercedes, is it? This is, a, a, this is an exploration vehicle that has been built to withstand the highest of pressures. It's not going to be the swankiest or nicest looking thing, but it has previously worked in the past. But as with all machinery, you know, there can be technical problems, there can be issues that, that crop up and occur. It's, yeah. It's, it's a story that has captivated so many people. It's like, because it's extraordinary. It is. It's like the Chile, Chilean miners. miners yeah. It's like the Thailand football children who got stuck in the cave. Yeah. You're desperate, hoping for that really good information to know the huge search and rescue operation that's now unfolding, as we said, the United States, mm -hmm. Canada, potentially the UK helping out. As I was saying before there, a defence source from... The MOD is telling me that they are trying their best to help deliver this underwater imaging vehicle from this British company so that, that everybody seems to be trying to club in together. But and in fact, um, the Foreign Secretary James Cleverly has just spoken about this. Let's see what he has to say. I want to put on record uh, the UK government's uh, thoughts to uh, those individuals who uh, are currently in the uh, submersible in the North Atlantic we wish, uh, we wish them uh, uh, all the luck uh, and of course we hope that they will be uh, swiftly found and uh, returned to their loved ones. Oliver, thank you very much indeed. Are we going to be kept abreast of this story throughout the programme?